Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we welcome you to this week's Focus Israel Report. In this week's report, we're going to be sharing with you regarding the current status of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, and it is as follows. As the April 29th deadline approaches to extend direct peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians, Palestinian Authority President Israel and the Palestinians failed to agree to extend their peace talks past April the 29th. Why did the talks fail? An Israeli government official familiar with the negotiations said, We would have liked to see a successful outcome to the negotiations, but what we saw was a Palestinian side that didn't engage in good faith when the United States put on the table principles for a final status agreement. In dealing with the core issues, the Palestinians simply ran away from the table. However, the U.S. version of why the current round of negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians failed is fundamentally different to the one presented by Israeli officials. The list of those to blame for this failure is also very different. From the U.S. perspective, the issue of the settlements was largely to blame. Senior American officials involved in U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's peace push shared their view on the talks failure. The U.S. team will be disbanded in the coming days, either most of it or all of it. Kerry has not yet decided what he's going to do next, whether he's going to wait several months and then try to renew the peace talks or release U.S. principles for a framework agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. By releasing the U.S. framework, Kerry would force the two sides to play offense each side in its own internal battleground. But in doing so, he also risks exposing himself to criticism from both sides. Using advanced computer software, the U.S. drew a border outline in the West Bank that gives Israel sovereignty over some 80% of the settlers that live there. The remaining 20% are meant to evacuate. In Jerusalem, the proposed border is based on former U.S. President Bill Clinton's plan, that is, Jewish neighborhoods to Israel and Arab neighborhoods to the Palestinians. The Israeli government made no response to the American plan and avoided drawing its own border outline. U.S. officials explained that the negotiations had to start with the decision to freeze Israel settlement construction. The U.S. thought that they couldn't achieve that because of the current makeup of the Israeli government, so they gave up. The U.S. didn't realize that Netanyahu was using the announcement of tenders for new settlement construction as a way to ensure the survival of his own government. We didn't realize continuing construction allowed ministers in the Israeli government to very effectively sabotage the success of the talks. There are a lot of reasons for the peace effort's failure, but people in Israel shouldn't ignore the bitter truth. And that is the primary sabotage came from Israel building new settlements. The Palestinians don't believe that Israel really intends to let them found a state when, at the same time, Israel is building settlements on the territory meant for that state. We're talking about the announcement of 14,000 housing units, no less. At this point, it's very hard to see how the negotiations could be renewed, let alone lead to a permanent agreement. At the end of the peace talks, Abbas demanded a three-month freeze on settlement construction. His working assumption was that if a peace agreement was reached, Israel could build along the new border as it pleases. But Israel said no. U.S. President Barack Obama supported Kerry throughout the duration of the peace talks. The clearest example of this was his willingness to prepare for Israeli spy Jonathan Pollard's release from U.S. prison. Such a move wouldn't have helped his popularity in the U.S. security system. It is true that Obama was doubtful. That was obvious from the start. He questioned the willingness of leaders on both sides to take the necessary risks for peace. In the end, Obama realized that he was right. Kerry talked on the phone with Netanyahu three times a week and sometimes three times a day. There were video conference calls and close to 70 meetings. The relationship of trust between Kerry and Netanyahu was crucial to ensure that Netanyahu tempered his positions and moved forward. During the negotiations, Israel presented its security needs in the West Bank. It demanded complete control over the territories. This told the Palestinians that nothing was going to change 
change on the security front. Israel was not willing to agree to time frames. Its control of the West Bank would continue indefinitely. Therefore, Abbas reached the conclusion that there was nothing for him in such an agreement. He's now 79 years old. In February, Abbas arrived at a Paris hotel for a meeting with Kerry. Abbas had a lingering serious cold. I'm under a lot of pressure, he complained. I'm sick of this. He rejected all of Kerry's ideas. A month later, in March, Abbas was invited to the White House. Obama presented the American formulated principles verbally, not in writing, but Abbas refused. Abbas demanded the outlining for borders, which he viewed should be the first topic of discussion with Israel. It would be agreed upon within three months. A time frame would be set for the evacuation of Israelis from sovereign Palestinian territories. Israel had agreed to complete the evacuation of Sinai in the 1979 peace agreement with Egypt within three years. Israel would agree to have East Jerusalem as the capital of a Palestinian state. However, Israel did not agree to any of these three demands by Abbas. The U.S. couldn't confront the two sides with the painful solutions that were required of both parties. Israel didn't have to face the possibility of dividing Jerusalem into two capitals, and they didn't have to deal with the meaning of a full withdrawal and the end of occupation. Abbas refused to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. The U.S. couldn't understand why it bothered Abbas so much to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. For us, the Americans, the Jewish identity of Israel is obvious. We wanted to believe that, for the Palestinians, this was a tactical move. They wanted to get something in return, and that's why they were saying no. The more Israel hardened its demands, the more the Palestinians' refusal deepened. Israel made this into a huge deal, a position that wouldn't change under any circumstances. The Palestinians came to the conclusion that Israel was pulling a nasty trick on them. They suspected there was an effort to get from them approval of the Zionist view of history. As of now, nothing is stopping the Palestinians from turning to the international community. The Palestinians are tired of the status quo. They will get their state in the end, whether it comes through violence or by turning to international organizations. The boycott and the Palestinian application to international organizations are medium-range problems. The U.S. will help, but there's no guarantee that its support will be enough. The U.S. is taking a time out to think and reevaluate things. We mean to draw our own conclusions. Kerry's willingness to return and make an effort to renew peace talks depends on the side's willingness to show seriousness. Abbas's conditions were rejected out of hand by Israel. Perhaps someone in Israel will reconsider their positions. Why is a three-month settlement construction freeze such a big deal? Why not draw a map? You have a great interest in an accord reached by mutual consent, rather than one reached as a result of external pressures. Drawing a map should have been stage one. As for what the U.S. would do next, Kerry hasn't fully decided. Israel's Deputy Defense Minister Danny Danone expressed displeasure over U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's views and comments regarding the failure of the peace process. Most recently, Kerry indicated in a private event that the failure of the peace talks would quickly lead toward Israel becoming an apartheid state. While Israel accepts the Secretary's latest expression of regret for failed peace talks, comparing the democratic state of Israel with one of the darkest regimes in modern history is an insult. However, this was not a solitary incident. Time and again, Secretary Kerry's erroneous declarations have come dangerously close to suggesting moral equivalency between Israel and its adversaries. They call into question his administration's ability to act as an honest broker in the Middle East. For example, last July, just three months after the negotiations began, Kerry gave a joint interview to Israeli and Palestinian television channels with the aim of increasing public support for his efforts. When asked by the Israeli reporter why these talks are so vital, the secretary failed to detail what the fruits of a real peace might be for the Israeli people, nor did he recount the numerous efforts and overtures successful Israeli governments have made toward this end over the years. Instead, he bleakly replied with a question of his own, asking, does Israel want a third intifada or Palestinian uprising, which results in violence? By insinuating that if Israel does not give in to every Palestinian demand to ensure a successful end to the talks, 
we would return to the era of suicide bombers murdering hundreds of civilians in Israeli city centers, the secretary basically asked the state of Israel to negotiate with a loaded gun to our heads. Then, in February, while addressing a conference in Germany, Kerry issued another veiled threat to Israel. This time, he informed his audience, The risks are very high for Israel. People are talking about boycott. That will intensify in the case of failure. Once again, instead of laying out a clear vision for why the talks he has invested so much time and effort in are in Israel's interest, Kerry attempted to scare the Israeli public into capitulation. His attempts were viewed here in Israel as a not-so-cryptic message that the United States would no longer retain its steadfast rejection of any boycotts against Israel if our government did not ensure that the talks would end to the U.S. administration's liking. But a recent warning from Secretary Kerry was especially troubling. Speaking to an audience in the United States, he informed them that a failure to establish a 23rd Arab state alongside the world's only Jewish state would result in an apartheid state with second-class citizens. This comment made behind closed doors was made public as we in Israel were marking the solemn day when we remember the more than 6 million victims of our people murdered in the Holocaust last century in Europe. To suggest that the Jewish people would ever establish an apartheid regime was painful. As a result of failed peace talks, the Palestinian factions Hamas and Fatah announced that they had reached a historic agreement to end their differences and form a Palestinian unity government. Fatah is the sect of Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas. Hamas is a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they control the Gaza Strip. The agreement calls for the establishment of a Palestinian unity government within five weeks. Six months later, the Palestinians would hold presidential and parliamentary elections. The agreement also calls for activating and developing the PLO so as to allow Hamas and other Palestinian groups to join the organization's institutions. In addition, the accord calls for reviving the Palestinian Legislative Council, which has been paralyzed since Hamas drove the Palestinian Authority out of the Gaza Strip in 2007. Similar reconciliation agreements were reached in principle in the past but never implemented. Hamas leader Ishmael Hanea praised the agreement, saying, National reconciliation, ending the division, and mending the rift between Hamas Hamas and Fatah has become a national responsibility. This deal, Hanea said, comes at a time of an assault on the Palestinian cause, assault on the al Ask Mosque, and a time when the entirety of Jerusalem is being painted Jewish. Today, we can say that Hamas and Fatah agreed about all that we discussed, senior Fatah official Hassan al-Ahmed said, adding, so we will forget what has happened in the past that caused hurt between Hamas and Fatah. The result of these efforts that we have made is clear today, as we agreed on all the points that we discussed. A Palestinian official said that there had been an agreement in principle on forming a government of experts, a term for a cabinet staffed by technocrats rather than elected politicians. In making the agreement, Hamas said that they would not recognize Israel, although they indicated that they would not obstruct negotiations between the Palestinian Authority and Israel. Sami Abu Zuri, a spokesman for the Hamas movement, said, We acknowledge that Abbas's recognition of the occupation is his traditional position. That's nothing new. The Hamas movement position is unwavering in not recognizing Israeli occupation in any form. In any event, negotiations are the task of the Palestinian Authority. The Hamas government has no part in them, Abu Zuri said. The question of recognition is non-debatable as long as Israel occupies our land. He asserted that the Palestinian Authority was in charge of negotiations with Israel and Palestinian foreign policy, adding that Hamas is not responsible for the Palestinian Authority relations with Israel. A top Hamas official boasted that the organization's forces would not be bound to follow instruction from Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas and dismissed claims that a planned unity government would recognize Israel. Well, that's going to conclude this week's report. Until we do it again, Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.